When coming up with a cohesive strategy and style for how to play and coach PUBG at a competitive level, I asked myself, when you boil PUBG down to its core, what are its most basic principles? If you were to ask me, I would say that first and foremost, the game is about three things. Information, positioning, and timing. In my first video in this series, I discussed wide rotations, which have to do with positioning and timing. In this video, I'll be breaking down the information aspect of the game to show you how to think about the game on a competitive level. The first thing about information in PUBG is that there are two types, active information and passive information. Active information is a little more easy. It's simply the things happening around you that you can see or hear yourself. For example, seeing a vehicle driving in the distance or hearing shots from a compound. This is information that you objectively know for a fact since you've confirmed it for yourself. For example, one of the most common places to look for active information is Mount Everest on Erangel. Everest is, according to its name, the highest point in most of the map on Erangel. It being the highest point makes it extremely easy to look out across multiple areas and gather information, this information being active information. When you can look at so many different places and compounds, it really narrows down what's available and what's not available. This active information is extremely beneficial in uh, decision making, both in your regular games at home and matchmaking and in professional play. Passive information is essentially all types of information you have outside of the active information framework. Passive information gathering is essential to success at a top level of play in PUBG. The ability to gather, understand, and utilize passive information to your advantage is one of the main things that truly separates the best teams from the rest. The easiest way to get passive information is by analyzing games that have already happened in the past. As one plays through so many games, they may make a mental note to themselves about which compounds are free in which circles, which compounds are taken, what rotation paths are taken, etc. On a pro level, this is often accelerated through VOD review, watching replays, and more. If you look closely, there are always plenty of tendencies that you can pick out and utilize to your advantage. These tendencies can often be key for pro teams looking to generate a strategy for themselves going into an event. However, passive information has its limits, and a lesson that I have learned is that no matter how confident you are in your ability to use it, it's not nearly infallible. There are a few mistakes that make you feel as stupid as watching a replay and seeing that the compound you should have rotated to was free, but decided against it because you assumed it was already taken. Further, it can be quite difficult to keep track of all of your passive information at once. In a match where you're playing against 15 or, god forbid, 19 other opponents, trying to keep track of where every single enemy is might not just be challenging, it might be pretty much impossible, especially when every team will have different tendencies for every circle. This is the reason why you will sometimes see teams like FaZe have a couple very poor results over the course of an event. FaZe's play style is very reliant on using passive information correctly, and although they bounced back later in the event, at the WSOE Pan Continental, FaZe started off the tournament with a 16th and a 15th place. Their decision making looked really off and unlike how they usually play. They seem to be making mistakes that they wouldn't often make, and especially in the first game, this is largely due to how they misjudged their passive information. So let's take a closer look at the first game from the Pan Continental. The first thing we should look at is, of course, the map. I want everyone to especially keep in mind the teams that are on the eastern side of the map. So that would be NRG, Totality, Phase, and SSG. These are the teams that we're going to be looking at in terms of how they chose to go about using the information they had, as well as the passive information they had. This is a really good game to analyze because, as I already mentioned, while FaZe went out in 16th this game, SSG actually won the game, and NRG actually got second. Which means that they used their information that they had in a much more effective way than FaZe Clan did. Had FaZe Clan made the same decisions that SSG did, they could have won the game as well. First, I'll talk through what actually happened in the game, and then I'll go back to it and talk about why SSG and NRG made really good decisions and FaZe Clan did not make a good decision, as well as why they made the decisions they did. Just before the second circle closes, NRG sends a scout to school to check if it's free, which it is, allowing the remaining members to follow in his footsteps once the circle closes. This is the position that NRG are able to remain in for the rest of the round. When the circle closes, FaZe knows that they will have to make an aggressive push for a position near the center of the circle. They make the judgment call to crash Razak, which unfortunately ends with them all dying upon reaching it. SSG, who are a bit later on rotation than FaZe, make a similar call to crash a location near the center of the circle. However, instead of crashing Razak, they choose to crash apartments. This decision ends up winning them the game. So how did these teams make their decision about where to rotate? It's a bit more complex than you may initially think. In this game, all of the teams on the eastern side of the circle had a tough call to make on where to rotate. The information that they had to work with was usually pretty limited. 
NRG had probably the best position on Volcano that would have allowed them the greatest amount of information of all the teams on the uh, other part of the circle. Uh, the forested hills to the east of Razak limited the amount of active information that FaZe could obtain to a certain degree. While they could look from the hill east, they could not see a majority of what was over there. And SSG themselves are still rotating on the edge in vehicles and would have had next to no active information about the center of the circle. Energy's decision would have probably been a relatively simple one, where they could probably know from their position that uh, the Razak area would be relatively populated, uh, while they would have had a sight line on the school area to see that it wasn't. Sending a scout over there for confirmation would just be icing on the cake, and then they're able to get that central position for free. SSG's decision is one that requires some passive information of our own to fully understand. So one thing that's important to know is that SSG is actually one of the teams that is most willing to play out of apartments and in that zone uh, in the mid to late game. Most teams aren't fond of it for a good reason, because apartments are difficult to push out of in just about every direction. Uh, you can be shot at from multiple angles, and other teams can also push into it and share the space with you. Uh, so tactically, while there are many disadvantages to playing there, it seems like SSG doesn't mind that as much. But those reasons are probably why FaZe was so hesitant to go to apartments. Uh, and this ended up being uh, their downfall in this game. So the majority of teams playing in this event are very good and smart teams, and they should all know that apartments and school are not great places to contest due to the reasons I already mentioned. This is the reason why we see so much congestion of teams inside of Rosshawk. So Rosshawk is simply better to play out of on a tactical level. The reason that this is tricky in the pro level is because everyone else knows that this is true, and not everyone can hold the best position on the map. So the people that generally get to hold these positions are the ones who get there first. And FaZe, SSG, and NRG in this game are all late to the party being on the eastern side. So because of this, they should probably want to try to rotate to a place that is still relatively near the center here, but perhaps less valuable, and by proxy less contested. NRG and SSG do this, again with school and apartments respectively, and it pays off big time for them with a second and a first place each. FaZe, on the other hand, makes an error in judgment, and underestimates just how populated Razak was, causing their 16th place finish. Even the best teams in the world can make mistakes and screw up, especially so when they are dealing with only passive information. But, make no mistake, NRG and SSG did not get any more lucky than FaZe did in this game. All three teams are dealt very similar hands, but only two of them are able to capitalize on it. There's a lot that these three and other teams can take away from this game, as it's very exemplary of how teams play around the information they have, and how intricate the decision-making process can be. Hopefully this video is able to show you the basics of how teams are looking for information and also using it in-game. If anything was unclear, feel free to leave a comment and I'll try to clarify further. I'll be trying to upload my next video sometime in early August when I return from PGI, so look out for that. Thanks for watching.